Hello, everybody, and welcome to the HTML All the Things podcast, episode number 62, Web Development versus Native App Development. I'm your host, Matt Lawrence, and I'm joined again by my co-host, Mike Coran. If you've been enjoying the podcast so far and you want to support us, there are a couple of ways that you can do that. You can review us on the Apple Podcasts or on whatever platform podcast platform that you listen to this on you can also check us out on patreon we only have a couple of tiers right now but that three dollar tier will give you a shout out on the podcast and we will share a link to your website in the show notes and the most important one is you can let your friends know tell your friends your family your mom whoever that we are here we have this weekly show and we're ready to be listened to and if they really like the show they can come and hang out with us that's on our discord server of course and of course, Mike has his phone ringing rudely in the middle of our, uh, in the middle of the shameless self plug saga know, as well. By exactly. the way, like just leaves his phone on, doesn't give a crap. But anyway, our Discord server. Don't worry, I'll appreciate you more than Mike will. In our Discord <laughs> server, if you join it, uh, we have uh, around 200, if not 200 members already. So uh, lots of people in there chatting away, giving help on various things, WordPress, PHP, JS. whatever your fancy. We got it in there as well as movies, TV, and whatever else off topic stuff. But anyway, weekly pain point, and mine is uh, Mike's phone ringing. Mike, please take it away. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Sorry about the phone ringing. That's from my watch vibrating extremely loud. I don't know why it just did that. Phone's on silent. Anyway, uh, weekly pain point is learning too many different technologies at the same time. So over the past few months, I've been kind of flip-flopping between all these different projects and technologies uh, and I'll be talking a little bit about that actually in this episode, uh, some of them at least. Uh, and it's just been taxing on the brain. Like I was sitting there on a Sunday trying to code something and I was doing some database querying in GraphQL. And I'm like, this is, I'm going, this is going too far. It's like at 8 p.m. on a Sunday and I can't, like, I can't even focus on GraphQL because I'm thinking about other technologies that I'm trying to figure out as well. And I'm starting to get like everything melded together where I was trying to type like, uh, some random code into my GraphQL career. Anyway, it was just a kind of a disaster. So that, that, that's that been my pain point, And I've been kind of trying to rectify that a little bit with consolidation. Uh, but that's about it for me. What about you, Matt? Well, actually, a comment on yours. It kind of sounds like you reached the point where like I, I, I'll kind of like uh, acknowledge it as I literally can't think. Like I just like hit a wall where I'm like, oh, like I'm unable to problem solve or troubleshoot this next thing just because I am unable to get these thoughts to like go forward in my head. Like I've hit a wall and that's it. Like I can't think anymore. Exactly. Um, which, which is hell. But this week actually um, we are choosing some new technologies. So um, we kind of, we're kind of graduating from a more simple CMS and we have like a, a, a fair bit of projects that are kind of in the pipeline. Some of them have been confirmed, some of them that are coming, coming down that pipeline. And so we're kind of trying to get something that's a little more scalable that works for smaller sites and bigger sites. I'm talking specifically about a CMS. Um, and so we're kind of choosing different tech, like whether we want to change up our UI tech, whether we want to change up um, our CMS, blah, 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 blah. So we're kind of doing kind of R and D in that area now consulting with some people that we know as well, that type of thing. So that's, that's sort of my weekly pain point is um, trying to determine which, which technology to learn because it has to kind of last us a while. Um, but uh, this is a mic heavy episode actually. So uh, Mike, make sure your phone's on silent and uh, take it to, uh, as he looks. I saw that. I saw I, you, have, you have to I'm check after all this, after all this, you didn't even, you didn't even actually put it on silent. It just looks like, Oh, I better, I hope no one calls. But anyway, Mike, take it away once again. All right. De- to defend myself, I'm looking at my watch because my phone is on silent and I don't really know what to do about my watch. So anyway, it's another, I guess, first world problem. Like your, your watch actually as a, as a brief aside, cause I have the same problem. Your watch takes precedent over everything. So for example, if a phone call comes in, and your phone's on silent, but your watch is not. Your watch will ring, or will ring or vibrate. If oh, your you watch know. is ringing, or sorry, if your phone is ringing, and or, or vibrating, and your watch is you know doing the doing the vibration because it doesn't ring, and you and you silence the watch by like saying like oh ignore the call, but I'm not gonna press like cancel. You know what I'm trying to say? Like you just say like I acknowledge there's a call coming in. I'll let it go to voicemail naturally. If you click the button on your watch, it will then silence the phone. And the watch. Okay. If you just tap the power button on your phone, your watch will continue to vibrate. That's annoying. Okay. It's it's weird, but that's how it works. 
I learn something new every day, I guess. Uh, so, just to kind of give an overview of this episode, um, I've been doing a lot of different kind of techniques to try to get cross-platform development to work. So the first thing I'm going to do is kind of give you a overview on what cross-platform development is. And I've, I've already talked about this a few times in uh, in this podcast, but I just want to give a quick overview of what cross, cross-platform development is. And then we'll move on and talk specifically the differences between not cross-platform development, but web development and native app development. So first things first, cross-platform development. And again, speaking of all the different technologies, here's a bunch of different ones. Uh, the ones that we use, the ones that we use the most right now are Cordova. Uh, it's an Apache Cordova service that uh, allows you to build HTML code into native code, like for iOS. I think they support iOS, Microsoft, uh, and Android. I, they might support even more. I, I believe at some point they even supported BlackBerry, um, stuff like that. Like they, they they've supported quite a few services. Oh, oh, Cordova definitely did BlackBerry Ten, yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So they they did support a bunch of different. Uh, a bunch of different technologies, but essentially right now what we use it for specifically is iOS and Android development from an HTML uh, site. So you can build HTML code however you want. Uh, you can use Vue.js and just hit the build pro- uh, like npm run build, uh, or you can just build like regular static files, however you want, as long as it's HTML code, it won't work with a PHP generated website uh, just because there's it, it just doesn't work with that. We tried. So it works great for quick quick and dirty like really easy informational sites or really simple web apps that like you know you're just t- entering in information and out- outputting some other information uh but when what the hiccup happens is if you're doing any sort of heavy media content like watching videos for a long periods of time or using the camera and rendering images and you know if you want to get good camera quality it does have camera API support, but it's kind of really janky. It, it doesn't really let you do much with that camera. It'll only let you like take a picture and then use that picture for whatever you want. And each phone, each manufacturer treats that camera differently. So you kind of have to adapt. It's, it's not as easy and trivial as it sounds. So that led us into a different platform, different technology called Flutter, which is a little bit more to the metal cross-platform development. Again, the same thing, you're kind of, you're developing for both Android and iOS. Um, and this gives you a little bit more, uh, ac- a little bit more metal access to the API. So when you're getting the camera, when you're, when you're watching videos, you're using a little bit more of the resources of the device uh, it's doing it a little bit more efficiently. Uh, again, it's not perfect. Like it's not the same as native as much as you want to say, if you're doing heavy media stuff, or if you're doing a very, like an intense amount of processing, it's not the same as native app development, but it's better. And that's kind of where we move to. We just need something better. Like the, the camera performance is still not on par with a native camera performance processor. Uh, I, I believe it can't like the Andro- a new Android processor is, is available now. Flutter doesn't support it yet where you can actually use some of the pixel features in your camera apps, which is cool. I'm hoping that Flutter does support it at some point in the future. And that would, uh, that would make quality a lot better. But a, a brief aside about Flutter actually is that we actually do have a past episode where we weren't ripping on Flutter, but I think we were hesitant on using it. Yes. Cause there is a comment true. where someone was saying like, you guys are all wrong about Flutter, but we were, I mean, I don't remember the episode exactly. I didn't go back and listen to it, but I'm pretty sure we were like hesitant, like, oh, I wonder if this is just another one of those fads that show up and then say, we're here for cross-platform and then disappear overnight kind of thing. Absolutely. And and we, I think there's, it's relatively stable at this point, but why we were concerned and I, honestly, like there's some people around this project that are still concerned is the fact that it's owned by Google. <laughs> Both the language and the the framework are owned by Google. So the language that Flutter uses is called Dart. It's different than JavaScript. It's an object oriented language. It's uh, and I'll talk about what ob- like what what the what that means and stuff like that a little bit later. But essentially, um, because Google owns the whole project, that's why we said we were concerned. But to that person's point, someone called us out and said that it is something that's being used in production and stuff like that. It is actually being used in production. I agree. I've seen it myself. They are very helpful. Like I've contacted the Flutter team several occasions now. I've contacted direct Google Flutter developers. I've talked contacted just regular Flutter developers, and they've all been extremely helpful and extremely quick to solve any of my issues. So I do have pretty high hopes for it, and I am using it currently to build a production level application 
Um, so take that however you want. Uh, I guess I didn't. We didn't listen to ourselves, even though I, I'm pretty sure we weren't that down on it. I'm pretty sure I just said like, just be careful. It is a Google, you know, a Google controlled ecosystem. We all know what Google does sometimes. Well, this, I mean, does anyone remember Allo? Exactly, exactly. But to be fair, this does seem like a different thing. Like it's been, I believe, three or four years now of consistent upswing. Right. So what, how, how you can tell with a Google project that it's going to go down is when they announce it and there's a huge upswing and then everything kind of goes down slowly and slowly and everything is like it's, it doesn't go like it doesn't plummet to the floor. But if excitement for it and development for it, you could see it going down a little bit, even if it's a tiny bit and a bunch of people love the project, there's a very good chance that people will just it'll just be abandoned with Flutter. It started on a low key level on a very low level. And it gained popularity and it's not losing anything. It's only going up and up and up and is ex- exponentially becoming more stable. It is released in version 1. something right now uh, where they actually released a new version that supports the web. Now, it's still a little bit janky with the web and stuff like that, but they do support the web. So you're allowed to build for three platforms with dark code, uh, Android, iOS, and web develop- web. So that's kind of cool. That's something that I'll definitely explore. And as I explore it, I will definitely report back. Uh, there will be another episode on Flutter and its intricacies and its issues and stuff like that. So stay tuned. Um, with that being said, the other technology that we use for cross-platform development is PWAs, so progressive web apps. Again, we've had an episode about this. I'm not going to go too, too deep into it, but it's essentially packaging a regular website with a little bit of the functionality of a native application. And then you're essentially putting it in a browser kind of situation and telling the browser that this is a special type of app. It's called a progressive web app. So you can treat it more native. And what allows you to do on both iOS and Android is add it to your home screen. And it kind of feels like a native application. Uh, Android gives it a lot of access to hardware APIs. iOS still is very hesitant to give like a lot of access. Like you still don't have access to camera functionality. Uh, You still don't have access to push notifications and stuff like that. Um, but you still like you do have access to some other stuff uh, like the I think device orientation. I mean, you have access to that regardless um, storage like you can store a lot of data like you can cache a lot of data with a, a PWA more than you could with a regular application, stuff like that. So and, and also it provides offline functionality so you can actually use PWAs when you're not connected to the Internet. We have used that. I, st- I actually have one out there in production right now. Uh, they are great, especially for quick development. Because again, with ha- being a web developer, I know web technologies really well. So when I develop something for the web, it's it's a lot quicker than if I were to go in and try to re- develop something for native Android or native iOS. Next technology here is React Native. Now, this is something that I've only looked into and haven't actually used. Again, it's it's a similar thing where it's developing for iOS and Android. Uh, it uses a different templating platform than just basic HTML. So that's its differentiation. It is a little bit more to the metal. It is a little bit more render, like it, it renders a little bit better on a device than something like Cordova because it's not just using web views. It has the capabilities of web views, but it's not just using web views. It is using some UI elements from the actual device, uh, device specific uh, UI elements. So it, it, it is a little bit better, but it still has pretty significant limitations um and uh it's just not something that we're i'm currently pursuing because again i i believe that flutter is going to overtake it that's kind of why i'm going with flutter instead of react native but react native is completely like solid solution for anyone out there that wants to look into it that's for sure um and then there's some some other ones like basically what we're looking at here what cross-platform is is if we're looking at ones that can build from one code base to several different operating systems. That's all it is. And I've, again, I've done quite a bit of research and developed with quite a bit of them. There's always going to be limitations. So with the, with that, like the limitations kind of drive you to program more natively. And it's not just like, okay, I'm going to, you know, redo this application from scratch. What I do is I actually, for stuff like the camera, like if I want better quality, I'll have to program a module like in a native language or I'll have to program a bridge between a couple of different languages or something like that. So I still at this point will have to go in and and learn a little bit of app development, like native app development to be able to kind of bridge between the web development cross-platform languages and a native application. 
So that's what I want to talk about. And I want to just point out, uh, I'm not an app developer. I'm not a native app developer at all. Uh, I am way more focused on web development. So take this all with a grain of salt. If you are an app developer, that's great. And I would like to hear from you actually of everything that I've done wrong or said wrong, uh, because I could definitely use some help in app development. So if you're, if you're, if you want to come point out all the wrong things, I will definitely take all the help I can get. Uh, because it's just, there's not as many resources out there for me as there is with web development. So having said that, uh, JavaScript is definitely my main language. So going from JavaScript to an object-oriented language like Objective-C or Java or Swift or Kotlin or even Dart, which is the, the Flutter language, it can take a little bit for me to kind of ramp my mind up and, and, and get my head around what's going on because it's a completely different way of programming, a way of programming UIs. It's a completely different file structure for programming your logic. How stuff works is different. And to start with that, uh, one thing that kind of always hindered me at the start whenever I start using an object-oriented language when I haven't used it for a while is inheritance for classes. It's kind of a complex pr principle for me because, again, I'm more of a web developer. Uh, so picture – the way that, the way I used to explain it is picture a bunch of base classes that the language has with built-in functionality for like initialization, component rendering, processing communications, and stuff like that. So there's something that this language has that's already been built by the engineers of that language, like Java or Kotlin or whatever. They have a bunch of different classes with base functionality. So when you're programming for apps, what you do usually is you take one of these pre-made classes and you extend it with an override or an extension. So that's how you have to start thinking is like, which of the classes that the that the people that have created this language can I use to then build a view in this language? And when you have that, you you extend that class with a specific syntax. It's, it's either an extend or something like that, like you, a specific keyword in that syntax. And then you build your own class on top of it that will then use the functions that they've created, the methods that they've created to put it into place. And then you can take those methods and override them. There's a lot to it. I don't want to overwhelm everyone because this isn't going to be an educational thing about how to program and how to be a native app developer. I just want to point out the differences, right? So knowing that, again, there is this difference where you're going to have to wrap your head around how these inheritance works. You're going to have to go in and figure out what these base classes are that, that you can extend and how to use them is something uh, is definitely valuable to kind of when you're going into a native app development to understand and wrap your head around. The other thing is, is that most object-oriented languages are strongly typed, while JavaScript is definitely not. It's very loosely typed. Uh, and what I mean by that is when you're declaring var declaring variables in uh, Java or uh, like Kotlin or Objective-C, you're putting the type of variable that it's going to be as a declaration. So if it's going to be an integer that you're declaring, like a one, two, three, a number that's between one and, you know, however long the integer is, it's a 32-bit or a 64-bit integer, whatever, um, you, you're going to have to use those numbers going forward. And when you, it's very distinct that you're declaring this variable as an integer. So it's an int, whatever, int a is equal to one. You know what I mean? Like that's how you would declare it. In JavaScript, you can just declare var a is equal to one and it will infer that that is a number sometimes. But then you can also do these crazy things in JavaScript where you could kind of do var a is equal to one and then var b is equal to var a plus a string. And it'll concatenate it for you and it'll figure it out for you. It's not typically the best way to do anything because it's a confusing infrastructure. Like if someone were to come in and look at your code, they'll be like, what are you doing? Why are you combining regular integers with, with strings? But some, it, JavaScript allows you to do that without giving you an error or anything. Whereas a strongly typed language will be like, no, you're trying to combine a string and an integer. It's impossible. You have to convert this string this integer into a string and then do the concatenation if you want to do something like that. And it's very deliberate in its in its ways. And it's uh, it'll tell you exactly what you're doing wrong when you're writing the integers. It's great for having a larger team and for some people looking at your code and understanding what you were writing. So when you're initializing all your variables, they know that, you know, variable A was supposed to be an integer. If it goes down here and all of a sudden you're doing something with it as a string, something's wrong. So that that's the way you can kind of use those types and those uh, keywords to help you with a larger code base. But again, for going from a JavaScript perspective, it's a little bit, it takes a little bit to wrap your head around. I actually have a, I actually have a question, um, more of a general question, I think. And it, it's, it's more, I'll say the question, then I'll kind of like do some backstory for it. So the question is, is how, 
how bogged down do you get in the lingo when you go to tackle um, a new language or when you're going to tackle like something brand new, like you're saying you're new to app development and that type of thing. And and what I mean by that is whenever I kind of go right, like if I go into something like brand new, like if you had, if you like call me and we're like, okay, I don't know, the web blew up and we're all just using C. Like we're just going to suddenly start using C code and be like, oh, I haven't done that in a really long time. I got to go back to the beginning. So I would literally start reading about it and you start getting into those things where they'll, they'll, they'll throw around like terms, right? Where it's like object oriented, you know, ints, this, that, the other thing, like whatever, like all the stuff you were just talking about. And I start to like worry right away because I start saying like, fuck, I'm not going to remember that this is an object. This is a function. This is a, this is a method. That's an int, but only in this case when it's like, like I'm not going to remember all these things. So I guess to like sort of, suffix my question is like how bogged down do you get into it and do, do you do you like keep reviewing the terminology over and over again or do you think that you should almost maybe ignore the terminology and just try to build a project but then when you look up like to get help people are going to be like well just change your method and you're gonna be like what the hell is my method so like i don't know if you have an answer to that yeah so let, let me let me uh try to try to wrap my head and answer that so when when i'm going into a new technology i do the same thing that everyone does i go in look at the documentation go in l- listen to some youtube videos try to start a starter project and stuff like that and like we were talking about last week i believe it was when we were talking about how to learn new technologies and and essentially what what we did to learn uh, ui frameworks i do the same thing so if i get into a technology and I read it and I'm not understanding the lingo, like the object oriented stuff and all that, I will take a step back and I will try to understand it from a base level. So I'll try to understand not exactly what object oriented means, but I'll try to understand how this language starts from the, from the beginning. So like, how does a basic application get rendered? How does a basic application work? And once I understand that, then I'll continue to move on. And with that, you'll start understanding the terminology and lingo a lot better when you go back to it. So like you said, I don't fully go into the lingo and start like I I do the same thing as you. When I see something that I don't understand, I'll freak out a little bit kind of thing. Like I'll be like, oh, this doesn't make any sense to me. Like what is object oriented? What is uh, what is, you know, strong typing and weak typing? What's a method in this language? Yeah. What's a method? What's a constructor? Like why is there classes, constructors, functions? Like what is all this stuff? I think it's bad to get like, you know, just go and start looking at a dictionary and try to figure it out. Because even if you were to figure out what everything works, how everything works, almost every language does them a little bit differently. So like a constructor in one language will refer to something a little bit different in a different language. So it's it's more important to understand how everything is working. And then going back to your like regular reading, when you see something, you'll be like, Oh, I see. So the object oriented was because of this. The the constructor is actually a method inside of here. Like you'll understand it a lot better. So don't my advice is to not get bogged down with the terminology. Don't let it uh don't let it stop you from going into the language or let it scare you. Just kind of learn the actual technology and the the terminology will come with that. And if you get it wrong in like in, when you're asking for help as long as it's not stack overflow, god for like you know, don't get anything wrong on Stack Overflow. Uh, but if you're asking people, they'll <laughs> usually, yeah, that's what I mean. Like they'll usually uh, be forgiving of it because we've all been there. Like t- terminology is a pain in the ass because there's just so much of it and it's just constantly changing and there's new stuff that you don't know about. So they'll usually try to help you out and stuff like that. Like when I was asking for help with a bunch of the Android and iOS problems that I was having, I was obviously getting a lot of the terminology wrong, and I, but I was still able to convey my issue using the knowledge that I gained from actually using it and studying it and reading some tutorials and doing stuff like that. So don't get too worried about it is essentially my, my advice. Okay, cool. Cause it, oh, yeah. it, it, it's definitely one of those things where I guess it's in the very beginning, just to kind of like, you know, end this, end this point is like in, in the very beginning, it's almost like trying to memorize like flashcards, right? Because you have no, Like you haven't learned the language at all. You're just sitting there being like a method is this an object oriented thing is this. This is how ints are declared in this language. Like you're really just doing pure memorization. But once you actually sort of massage that muscle, if you will, like like trying to start generating that muscle memory where you 
just naturally go, oh, I need a string here. And then you're like, then, you know what I mean? Like you, then you've generated like, oh, that's what a string is. You've generated what that is in your own head. So then you'll actually remember it or memorize it way faster. Yep, exactly. So yeah, and th- that's how I would approach the situation. But with that being said, uh, the next thing here that's kind of the difference between web development and native app development is the need to compile code and install applications. So every time you want to make a change in your application, you must then recompile the code. Now, depending on the change, the recompiling could be a little bit different. So a full recompile, like if you clean your build folder and do a recompile can take several minutes sometimes, depending on your machine, depending on the complexity of your code, et cetera, et cetera. But imagine every time you make a change in your JavaScript file, you hit compile and it'll take you minutes before you can test that change. That's it's a big difference and it's something that you kind of have to work around. And not only that, when you have native native code, you have to test on native devices or emulators of those devices. And the suggestion usually is test as many devices as you possibly can, as many emulators as you possibly can, because especially when you're talking about Android, you're talking about a lot of different variation in the hardware, like the cameras that are used, the speakers that are used, the touch screens that are used. So stuff that you think should work well might not work exactly like you think. Like I had an issue with my camera orientation where uh, there's some devices that, you know, when they install their cameras, they flip them. They do it like upside down. And so the the code will actually give you a sensor orientation meta tag. And so what I had to do is I had to read that sensor orientation and then automatically rotate it based on how much the camera is physically rotated in the device. Like you would never think that that would be an issue because like every time you you open a, a camera app or you use a camera app in HTML, it does all that logic for you. But when you're programming natively, it doesn't. So you have to kind of think of it in a different in a different sense. Same with aspect ratios, all the different device aspect ratios. You have to kind of take in, take those into account and do something that'll fit most devices. Like you can't help. You can't test on every single device. It's not possible, but do as much as you possibly can. So this all what I'm trying to say is this takes way more time than testing on a couple different browsers uh, uh, for web development. So this is a big thing that you kind of have to wrap your head around and, and have to adapt to. And when you're quoting a project, you have to understand that testing is a much bigger thing in native app development than it is in web development. That's for sure. Like there's just no if, answer, buts about it. And it's a much more cost costly thing because it's costly in terms of processor utilization and your computer being utilized and time. And it's costly because sometimes like if you're developing a large app, you got to buy all these devices that you think are going to be the most important ones, or you at least have to get your friends to test it or something like do whatever you can to get as many people to test on their devices as possible. Because again, it's, it's it can be different device to device. So that's something that kind of took me a little while to get used to. And uh, having to constantly recompile code is, is, is a pain. I don't like it. The one advantage of having to recompile code and is the fact that it does error checks on compiling. So when you're typing code and you type something completely wrong, uh, it the, the IDEs will usually tell you that something is wrong before you have to do any compiling or runtime or actually test that feature. Whereas with JavaScript, you can do a lot of things wrong. And then what you have to do is you have to kind of console log your way to figure out why it's wrong. Or you have to like do it and then all of a sudden it'll in the console crash and tell you why it's wrong while you're doing it. So it's tougher to catch errors in JavaScript than it is with uh, you know compiling and compile time errors and runtime errors and stuff like that. It's a little bit easier to get your errors out before they actually go and affect users. Um, that's one little positive. Again, the negative is that you have to deal with all these compile time errors that you wouldn't have had to deal with in, in JavaScript. So you take some, you lose some. I, I, actually, thing, I actually have a question, yep, if, you, if you don't mind. So this kind of goes back to that one point you were making regarding the various testing devices. Um, one of the... One of the things I was thinking is like, what if you had sort of an app, like, let's say you had two apps. So one, the, the one app is just very much just like a, an informational thing. So it's like, here's a list of, you know, blog posts, you click on them and it opens up the blog, hooray for your life. And then the next one is like an actual proper web app where it's using the cameras and that type of thing. Now, obviously due to probability, you'd probably want to do more testing on the one with the camera thing. But my question is, is with the variations in devices, how often are you finding that the basics, so that first app, would be affected by different Android devices versus 
the more complex things? Like, are the more complex things more affected by different hardware? Or are they equally as affected even on the simple things like opening windows? Like, are there weird orientation problems with, I don't know, opening the device and having it stretched to landscape or so- something weird? Uh, so, stretched to landscape and going from phone to tablet is a little bit weird. Okay. From device to device. But it's not as bad as... Uh, like a camera implementation or a video implementation and stuff like that. Okay. So the simpler apps, you definitely don't need as much testing, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, as the more, like the ones that use more hardware APIs. I got you. If that makes sense. Yeah, I got you. Okay, cool. Okay. So with that, uh, the next thing here, the another big difference is build systems. So Build systems are what kind of controls how your application is built for the device that you're using it for. So there's a couple different ones that that I've used, one for Android called Gradle and one for iOS called CocoaPods. So what these essentially do is you kind of put your configuration in them for how you want to build it, what app compatibility you want to have, what device compatibility you want to have, uh, which libraries you want to pull in, what dependencies you have, like stuff like that. Like there, there's a lot of information in these build files for the device to go in for the for the computer to take and then build it and compile it every time. So this is very different, obviously, from regular JavaScript development where we don't have those kinds of files and we're developing just for browsers. We don't have to specify what device we want to develop for. Uh, we don't have to do anything like that. What What version of the device we want to develop for. We can kind of do our own little build uh, things here and there or compatibility things here and there, but we don't have a single system that controls everything like that. Build systems can be an extreme, an extreme way, not waste of time, but it can be an extreme time sink because if you're not familiar with all the little intricacies and their formatting and their syntax, uh, you could be like stuck on a compile time error or a build error for a very long time to fit, trying to figure out the little niche, little like, incompatibility with this version of the build system and your current implementation of the camera, for instance, or something like that. There's little things that you're just not taught and you just have to kind of troubleshoot your way out of. Uh, And that's, it's been, I know build systems for me, like Gradle and CocoaPods both have been a huge time sink when I'm developing for uh, native app development systems. And it's something that I definitely am very happy that web development doesn't have to deal with. I'm, I take that as a full, like, web development is better because build systems are not in place. And I hope we never get build systems because, holy, are they bad. Now, what I've been hearing is that there's a lot of better build systems out there. Like, the reason I'm using older build systems like Gradle and CocoaPods is because usually I'm dealing with Cordova, which is an older cross-platform language. Uh, and it's built using, again, Objective-C and Java. And apparently, like, there's just some issues between newer build systems and older languages and stuff like that. But I am looking to kind of get into a new, a newer build system. So I don't have to deal with all these massive, like there's, there's been some times that I've spent like days trying to figure out why something's not building. But yeah, the, with that being said, the other thing here is device testing. So especially with Android devices, and I've already mentioned this, like I uh, having to test on every single device is a pain having emulators available for both is really nice. And with Android and and iOS, you can have emulators for kind of every single different device. But especially on iOS's side, you can't test some hardware API stuff like the camera. So for me, it's almost useless to use the emulator for most of the part. So I have to have iOS devices. I have to have an iPad um, to be able to test the camera functionality. I can test the, the layouts and you know, stuff like that, but I can't actually do the camera testing. On Android, you can pass through a camera so I can actually use my webcam as a camera in my emulator, which is great. But again, it's going to act differently than any of the devices that I use. So I literally have a 10-inch Lenovo tablet, a 15-inch Outform tablet. Um, What else do I use? I use my emulator on my computer for testing. I have like three different ones for three different versions of Android on there just to make sure that it works across different versions. Uh, what else? I have an old 10-inch Samsung tablet that I sometimes break out for some longevity testing. It's it's a device kind of, not catastrophe, but it's like I, I'm surrounded by devices at all times. And then with, with Apple, I'm also doing testing on 
two different iPads, one like iPad Air 2, which is an older device, and one newer or just regular iPad device. So like, it's a lot. And it's kind of a pain. I understand you have to kind of do that for web development as well. I'd test on as many devices as you can, but you're mostly just testing for, oh, does this look okay on these screen sizes, which you can kind of do with your inspect elements and you can kind of do with just one device and stuff or your like one emulator. It's not that big a deal. Um, obviously still better to test on as many devices as you can, but it's just device testing. It is a huge time sink, money sink, everything. So it's, it's, it would be nice to be back into the web development world where I'm a little bit more, it's a little bit easier to do the, the testing. Whereas with this, like, you know, again, compiling every time, putting it on a device and stuff like that. So with that being said, I think that kind of wraps up my web development versus app development thoughts. Um, there's a lot more to talk about. Obviously, there's a lot of complexities here and there with it. Uh, but the big, a big thing that I want to point out is, again, I am not an app native app developer. I'm more of a web developer. And I, I, I like the rapid prototyping of web development a lot better. Like I'm much faster in being able to get a system up and running and start testing than I am with app development. I feel like app development is a longer process, a longer cycle. That might be good for some people, but for me, I'm definitely more on the website. Um, but I, I would be curious to hear if anyone out there does do any app development and how much of this I got right or wrong in their eyes. Cool. Well, that was uh, that was pretty insightful. And um, it's kind of interesting how... I guess how different how different the two different app developments can be. Like, I mean, I've mentioned to some people when they've been like a, an app developer, and all you you know, you'll mention like, oh, I'm I, you know, I'm a web developer, and they just think like, oh, it's totally different. And back in the day, I was always thinking like, well, that, that guy's kind of a jerk, but it is like it's it's a totally different world. It's a totally different thing. You have to compile, you have to do all these all these crazy things, you have to test and that type of thing. Now, I actually have a follow up question to that. Do you think that I guess it's kind of two questions. So with all that being said, the building, the testing, the whatever, what do you prefer in terms of native app development? Do you prefer the Apple environment or do you prefer the Android environment based on the fact that Apple, yes, has multiple devices, but I assume, and you can fill that in, that you do less testing because they're all kind of similar? Or do you prefer the Android environment despite the fact that there are like massive variations in hardware and literally almost countless types of devices out there, many of which we haven't even heard of. Yeah. So the problem with asking me that question is I've only worked with objective C and Java. I haven't worked with the newer languages like Kotlin and Swift. Right. So those languages apparently do bring everything a lot closer together. But for me, at least I'm much better with Java than I am with objective C. Like object objective C to me is a bad like I don't like objective C at all. Right, right. In any in any way, so I'm much more comfortable with Java. Like as 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 uncomfortable as I am with objective object oriented programming and Java, I'm much more comp uh, comfortable with it than I am with objective C. Having said that, one huge advantage of iOS is the speed. Like when I'm when I'm doing some sort of interfacing between web apps and uh, Android apps, like native Android apps in Android, I'm I'm talking like there's significant performance differences. So when I do an interface and I click like a button that sends information and then I receive it back or it opens a native view and then, you know, I close that native view, go back to my web view. That could take seconds, like two, three seconds, like three to five seconds, I would say. OK, OK. OK. With a, with iOS going between the native iOS view and the web view is instantaneous. Like I click the button to switch between the views and it's already there. Like it's so fast that I actually have to slow it down. So people aren't jarred. <laughs> I can't like the difference is ridiculous. So with all the jankiness of the objective C code that I don't like the performance of, of the Apple devices and Apple ecosystem is very consistent across the board, like even on older devices. Like I said, I have an iPad 2, Air 2, which is probably like six or seven years old now. There's no difference in performance of the applications that I'm writing between my, you know, seven year old device and my, or six year old device and my device from last year. How is your, Whereas with, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, I was going right. to say, how, how is, how is the testing across devices like the Apple Air 2, though? Like, do you, would you say that you only need to, test on one device like you like you know you just take 
let's say you just take the weakest link. So let's say you want to support all the way back to iPhone 5. Do you just like test on iPhone 5 and then is it safe to assume that it works on all the other Apple devices or is it more like Android where you still need to test like the iPhone 6, 7 and all the S's and all the rest of it? Yeah, I don't have a good answer for that because I, again, we only do iPad installations. So I don't, I haven't seen a difference between my five or six year old uh, iPad Air 2 and my new iPad. So if that answers your question, they're very similar, not only in the fact that they perform the same right but the layout is exactly the same like so for the same size the screens have different resolutions i i believe but they somehow make it so that the the device ratio is the same and they look identical device to device which is cool so yes it is easier and i would be more confident in rolling out an application having only tested on one device on apple than for sure i would feel on android like there's no doubts about it. because again I've had to do some real big, like, device-specific majiggering on Android. Right, yeah, because, like, yeah, because you, you already mentioned the the angle of the camera even is, like, oh, yep. the, it's rotated 45 degrees inside of the chassis, which you can't see because it's round. <laughs> so, like, yeah. okay, cool. All right. Um, unless you had any other points, Mike, I think it's time to dump, in, or time to dump into this web news. Time to jump into this web news because uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, kind of it's kind of a doozy, actually, this week. Let's do it. All right. So this web news um, is making things mobile. So this is sort of a uh, a UI UX sort of take on uh, mobile devices. And I'll, I'll kind of throw in some backstory right now. And then um, there's several questions. I'll kind of just rip through them all. But we'll probably have to kind of revisit them because some of them are pretty you know, fully loaded and we'll forget as we discuss. So uh, it's no mystery that smartphones have made uh, mobile computing easier and communications more accessible than ever. Uh, over time, they're used for more and more use cases, including things like digital wallets, GPS, taking photos, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And while these applications, um, among many others, are very useful on the go, they are also used for more intensive applications that allow us to do things like remote into PCs via like something like the TeamViewer app, or maybe use the CLI on a remote server, and that would be through something like Juice SSH, um, and even create something like PowerPoint presentations uh, for uh, your, well, just for presenting at your company. But using your phone while you're with others, so other people, is considered a very quote-unquote millennial thing to do. Um, texting people that are right beside you instead of talking to them directly. And, and while well, well, that's kind of more of like a stereotype these days. Uh, people are often seen scrolling through their phones rather than talking directly to the people that are beside them. So things like taking a photo or firing off a quick message or, you know, obviously using the GPS to get where we're going are very useful applications that can be more or less used judgment free when you're out with others. However, those other heavier applications that I mentioned, something like remoting into a server, for example, do take a decent amount of time and they do take a lot of brain power, which makes it almost impossible to focus on both the app and your surroundings at the same time. So here come the list of questions, like I said, fully loaded and there's a bunch of them. So we probably revisit, but how much do you use your phone when you're out with others? What applications are you using when you're on the go by yourself or when you're on the go with others? And then do you use heavier applications that require your full attention and then second part of that question would be, do you use them on the go or just at home? And then kind of a follow up, like I said, this is loaded. A follow up to that question is, do you think that people who use heavier applications at home should just use a computer where they'd probably be able to have a better UX overall? So, Mike, I'll kind of let you tackle that because I already kind of have sort of an answer prepared. OK, cool. Uh, so. Let me unravel this. So the first the first question was, how much do you use your phone while you're out with others? That is pretty simple to answer. It depends on how comfortable I am with that person. So if it's a new, if it, if it's someone that I'm not comfortable with, uh, or if it's a, not, not to say not comfortable, if it's someone that I haven't met before, or I've, I'm meeting for like the second or third time, I usually try not to use my phone as much as possible. And I interact with that person. If it's someone I've known my whole life and we're just sitting there watching TV or just sitting at a restaurant, we'll both be on our phones sometimes and then we'll show each other stuff on our phones. Like it, it depends on the comfort level. I I usually, like, like I said, meeting new people, I try to stay away from the phone as much as possible out of maybe etiquette or just, I don't know. It's just how I do it. Like I just, that's how I've always been. 
I always try to kind of like interact as much as possible in that situation and bring them into the conversation and all that. Um, and again, with like my wife, when we're at a restaurant and this might look weird to other people, but we're constantly on our phones usually like we'll talk and then we'll go back to our phones, check the me- check messages, like show each other funny videos and stuff like that. That just our comfort. That's our comfort zone. You know what I mean? And the same thing with, with most of my friends, unless I haven't seen them in a while where we're just catching up or something like that, then I'm not on my phone. But if it's someone that I see on a consistent basis, I'm usually on, like we're usually both on our phones at some point during the during the meal or during the evening or whatever. Um, I don't know if you want me, if you want to do this like me going through all the answers or do you want to tackle it one by one? Um, how loaded are your other answers? Because there's a Good lot, question. so like we could do yeah, each let's question. Do, let's each. do one by one. Okay, let's, let's do one by one. So you, yeah. Okay, so okay, so for me then to tackle the first question is, uh, how much do you use your phone when you're out with others? Is I actually don't really use my phone when I'm out and about, um, with the exception of things like I'm kind of a shutterbug, uh, especially since there's like unlimited photo storage now. So I kind of take my phone out a lot to take pictures, but it's like more so I'm not really pulling out my phone so much as I'm pulling out essentially a point and shoot. Um, obviously GPS and stuff like that. Like I've already mentioned, of course, I got to know where I'm going. Uh, but like short of me being like, oh, did you see this like crazy post? And then like sharing it, I'm not really on my phone. Like I'll at a restaurant with somebody that I'm either comfortable with or even not. I'll oftentimes, cause my phone's big, have like the phone on the tables. Cause it's all, like, they don't they want it to be stabbing me in my pocket, but like, I don't really flip it over or look at it much. Um, and I have gotten comments where people will be like, oh, you answer like quite quickly but then sometimes you don't answer for a while and that's usually because i've gone out doing something whether that be with a friend or whatever it doesn't really matter um and what's really weird actually is i'll notice that other people and i don't mind but other people will use their phones sort of more normally like you were saying you're like with your wife and then you guys just sort of use your phones i rarely do that unless there's like some sort of emergency going on like i have to message this person a lot because it's like a family member or something and I'll actually get like I guess it's I guess I'm so I'm so not on my phone when I'm out with when I'm out with people that I'll get comments when I'm when I am actually on my phone even if that person is on their phone constantly like if I start picking up my phone and typing a lot I'll get comments like you're always like you know your, your nose seems to be very in your phone today like what are you doing kind of thing so I guess it's like almost I've almost set like a precedent with some people where they're just like they just expect me not to pick it up uh, for whatever reason uh, but that's. I don't know that that's just me. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So, uh, to th- like that, th- that makes sense. We're different people. Like every everyone's different in a certain way, but to answer the second question, which is what applications are you using while you're out and about or with other, uh, on your own or with others kind of thing. Um, it's for me, it's mostly just kind of like if, if I'm out and about with others and we're using our phones, like, like I, like I said, with, people that I am comfortable around and I've known for a long time. It's mostly just going and checking like sports scores, uh, looking at Reddit posts, sharing Reddit posts, um, checking my emails, my messages, stuff like that. Like I don't, and, and camera, like I do, I do the same thing as you. I kind of take pictures here and there. Uh, that those are the most, the things that I use when I'm out and about with others. Uh, when I'm alone, the difference, I guess, would be sometimes I'll play a game. Like, I usually don't game unless it's Pokemon Go and I'm walking around. Or when you go through an ocean, as, as whatever was happening. I'm going in through your... an ocean right now. I don't know if you can hear that, but it's I, I crazy. Can, I can absolutely hear it. Is that, is that it what is, that is? That's rain? It is so loud. Yeah, it is extremely loud. Okay. So if you don't hear from me, I've probably drowned. Okay, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can't believe how heavy the rain is right now. But okay, so moving on, hopefully it's not that bad for other, for, ever, for the audience or you can edit it out or something like that. Um, that's kind of how I feel with using the applications. Now, I'll go on to the next question because that's like a shorter answer. Of course, yeah. Uh, do you find or use heavier applications that require your full attention? And again, when do you use them at home or on the go, or whatever? So again, I don't use heavier applications. Like the most I would do on my phone on a day-to-day basis is a project management kind of application like Asana or Todoist or something. I typically won't go and start like coding on my phone. I've never written a single line of code on my phone. I'll take notes sometimes with ideas for coding, but that's the, 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 it. The only thing that I have done, and it's interesting that you mentioned it with TeamViewer is I have TeamViewer on my phone to go into my computer because I forgot something. And 
I was out and about and I needed that information. Okay. And it was only on my computer at the time. So I have done that. The other thing I have done with TeamViewer, and this, again, this is probably the most intensive application I've used on my phone because I've used it a few times, is like I have TeamViewer set up for my grandparents for both sides. Okay. And if there's anything wrong with them and I'm on the go and they're like, usually if something's wrong, it's an emergency for them for some reason because their email is not sending or something. And they freak out. Like, I, I don't know if everyone's grandparents are the same, but my grandparents are definitely like that. Like, if there's something wrong with their computer, they think that the world's about to end and they start panicking. Like, it's full on panic. <laughs> like, they call everyone, they call everyone, my dad, everyone. They're just like, that's it. Our life's over. Like, we can't send an email. Like, that's not, like, not like, an exaggeration. Shut, shut that down. is how, yeah, shut it down. Like, that's it. We're just throwing this computer out. Like, it, it's ridiculous. Like, I've never seen someone not use a computer and then all of a sudden rely on it so much in my entire life that my grand both sides of my grandparents do this so when there's an issue like that and i'm out and about sometimes i'll go on team viewer and i'll fix that issue because it's usually like they forgot to close something or something like really simple right so those are the situations where i would use something more intensive i don't i don't use anything else that's intensive on the phone if that makes sense everything else is standard messaging email checking stuff like that like i'll even hesitate to write longer emails on the phone I'd rather just do it on my computer if I can avoid it. Yeah, I I think I'm kind of the same way. So, like, I'll kind of go through the two questions then. So, what applications are you using on your phone or on the go by yourself or with others? So, I will say, like, if I'm on the go by myself, I'm more – I don't really use intensive apps, like, necessarily, like, TeamViewer and stuff like that. But I'll use things that require a bit more attention. So, something like maybe reading some news articles – um, or playing a game, I'll do that when I'm on my when I'm by myself. Um, with others, I've already kind of mentioned, I'll use like the camera. Maybe I'll use like you know I'll I'll, sh- I'll shoot out a quick message if like you're trying to meet in a group and like one guy is still on his way or whatever, so you're trying to get updates that type of thing. Like of course, um, so I'll kind of use like messaging and that type of thing. Uh, that's kind of what I use out when I'm out with others. Uh, very very rarely will I do anything intensive. Like even though I'm like like I said a bit more like a shutter bug, it's it's not. Like, I'm not going to be editing my photos when I'm with the people unless it's like, unless we're on like some like stupidly long road trip and everyone's just kind of like conversationed out. Then it's like, okay, I can, now I can kind of treat it like as if I'm by myself kind of thing. Um, So that, that's sort of my answer to that. Um, For the other one about the other question, like, do you use, do you find your, do you find use in heavier applications that require your full attention and do you use them on the go or just at home? Photo editing apps, like I'll mess around with Lightroom here and there. Um... I more so do that on like on my computer, but I will do it on my phone as well. That I would do just at home. Um, I use heavier applications in that I use things like let's say OneDrive for transferring files around. So for example, I record another podcast as I mentioned before at like a studio, and then I take the file and I put that on my phone, and then I upload it a couple days later when our normal like publish time is. And so I use OneDrive in that regard, like I take the local file, they put it on my phone like a memory stick, and then I like upload it to OneDrive and then use it to like have it on my computer when I go to publish. So that's sort of like my heavier application. I don't really do things like TeamViewer um, really that often. Um, I, I use my phone sort of like a cloud device because it's a it's just always connected to the cloud, pretty much. So um, I use it, like I said, like w- as the middleman in those OneDrive situations. I will say that my phone, like I have done things like use Juice SSH. I do like Juice SSH to log into my like local servers. Like I have like one or two local servers here in the house. And so I will use them too, because sometimes you just need to restart it or something. And I'm not going to like go get a laptop out just to like log in via putty and say like reboot. I'm just going to do that on juice SSH. Or if I'm just like checking something like, Oh, is that service? Did that service die? Is that why this thing's not working? Maybe I need to restart it. I'll just quickly do that on juice. But if it goes beyond like that much mind power required for like status check or restart then i'm just gonna be like okay i need to get a computer out i need to get a laptop a tablet something like that and that kind of talks to the actually to the last question where i prefer the better ux my phone is very much i use it a lot like i do scroll through twitter and instagram and facebook here and there i do check messages and that type of thing and if i'm alone or just with family members i will you know, depending on the family member, I will just be on my phone because sometimes they'll be on their phone as well. But it's one of those things where I will prefer, like, sometimes I'm just like, man, I don't want to, I don't want to look at this on my phone. Like, even if someone sends me a PDF, sometimes I'm just like, I don't want to, I don't want to see this like, on here. I want to go onto like a full screen where I can open it on my second monitor 
and like be able to respond quickly, that type of thing. It that's just sort of my I guess I'm always kind of fishing for the better UX in that regard. However, I do like having a powerful enough phone to in an emergency do stuff on the go. Like I like the idea that I can since I'm always connected to the cloud anyway, I could team could download TeamViewer and I could do some work. But I do know some IT professionals that do work on their phone instead of their laptop because they just want to like let's say watch TV at home, but they'll keep working from TeamViewer. But like the experience is so bad, like zooming in and out and that type of thing. And that's not TeamViewer's fault. That's literally because we're talking about essentially two different mediums, right? It like the experience itself is like it. it you're interfacing between two different ones, and it's so bad in my opinion that I just. In an emergency, sure, but I'm not. I'm not gonna do that. Like I'm not into that for sure. Yeah, I, I I agree. Like I'm, I use my phone to do phone things. I guess like I haven't I haven't found a use case where it would be like good for a power user. Um, I read stuff on it. Like I do a lot of reading on my phone. I, whether it be news, books, uh, you know, posts, stuff like that. That's mostly what my phone is used for. I'll watch videos sometimes, YouTube videos, but rarely. And taking taking pictures and messaging. Like, that's really it. That's all my phone needs to do. Now, like, having a better screen is nice because I do a lot of reading, stuff like that. Having a faster processor is nice because I can go between the different, you know, apps quicker and it just feels better and nothing kind of, like, my, my apps don't close as often because of my RAM. Like, it's still nice to have a better phone, but I definitely don't use a phone to its full potential, if that makes sense. Like, I don't tax the processor like crazy while I'm reading a book. Or, and stuff like that. Right. I I will, like, I, I say that I don't use the heavy applications when I'm talking specifically about things like TeamViewer, but now that you mentioned, like, taxing the actual thing, I will say that I do tax my processor a fair bit. I will screen record things that I think are funny, and then I'll go into, I have the full version of, like, whatever that thing's called, Power Director, I think, or something like that. It's like a, it's like a full editing suite, uh, or full, full, full editing app. Yeah, Power Director on my phone, I have like the full pro version or whatever. And so I will, I will like edit videos on there. I have exported cause we'll do on this podcast and on my other one, we'll have like a video version of it where we just have like a title card, like one single visual that's like over a video. And then we put that on YouTube just for accessibility purposes. Some people just want to use YouTube or YouTube music or whatever. And so I will actually sometimes do that on my phone. Like I'll actually export it. Like I'll put it together in the timelines on my phone and like put it, put it together there. I do beat the crap out of my phone. Like not physically, like I will use the living hell out of it. I'm glad that I got, for example, the note because like, it's sort of like the big powerhouse, almost like a, almost like a laptop replacement in your pocket type of thing. I use a lot of storage. I use a lot of like, I do use the hell out of it, but I think, Actually, now that you mention it, it's specifically the UX stuff. Like using the multiple timelines for editing with PowerDirector is actually really well done. And with the pen, it's like super good. Like it's really nice. I used to use it on my S8 and it's way better on my S8 Plus, And now it's way better on here. Using it on my BlackBerry Key 2, which is right beside me here. I don't want to do that because the screen's kind of small, right? And there's no pen, that type of thing. Like like the BlackBerry Key 2 is that, that that's actually a good example is the BlackBerry Key 2. I use that thing um, full time and I still use it right now, but it was in my pocket, my only phone in my pocket for a few months. And everyone kept saying like, how do you do with the screen? How do you deal with this? How do you do with that? But I'm so utilitarian, like I use the living hell out of my phone, but I'm so utilitarian with it that I love the battery life. The camera was good enough and it had a dual camera system like you're right. But it, it's one of those things where I was able to type so damn fast on it that like the utilitarian part of it was so worth it because I am on my phone all the time, but it's because I'm messaging people and it's because I'm taking quick photos and it's because I'm GPSing and I could do that all on the key to kind of thing. So, and, and then like keyboard shortcuts are easier and that type of stuff. Like, yes, of course, smaller screen, different UX, but it, it, I don't know. It sounds like I'm flip-flopping, but I'm still not going to use things that have, I guess, a bad UX. And I'm still not going to use heavy applications when I'm with people. I, I think, I think this, I think all these questions stemmed from when companies say like, you can now do this on the go. Like, you know, when, um, 
a good example is like with I with like IT apps, for example. Like, oh, you can now manage this. I don't know this. I'm just making something up. This Cisco thing on the go now. You can now manage this other thing on the go. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Like, that's interesting. But then I think to myself, I'm like, are we really like so desperate to have people constantly connected to their workplace that we're like, man, we really need this IT person that is at their desk eight to 12 hours a day. We really need them so that when they leave, the thing in their pocket can buzz and then they can continue to like configure this Cisco router. Like it's almost kind of disgusting. I think that's kind of why I kind of thought this up where, yeah, it's super useful sometimes when you're, when you, when you need it. But I almost think that it, it, it's advertised and it, and it should be it's advertised like oh look at look how cool this feature is because it is cool but like how desperate are you to have have like someone there like i need this person to desperately fix every single issue within like two seconds and i'm not gonna hire somebody else i, I don't know maybe i'm weird um like that but i don't know i i don't know if you have any other comment mike but like i yeah i don't know i i, I I'm not sure. Like I, these enterprise I apps are, are weird when I need to. Yeah. The enterprise apps, again, if it was a situation where I was out and I had to fix something, I would use my team viewer or whatever other enter- enterprise app in other situations. I would not go out of my way to do that. Like, I don't know why you would, if you have a laptop sitting there, even if you are sitting on the couch and watching TV, I would just pull my laptop out and do it there. Like I would never put myself through that on a phone Unless I absolutely have to, if that makes sense. And that's like, I think, I think that's what most people like. I don't think people enjoy just going on their team viewer on their phone and figuring out like zooming in and out like crazy when they have other options. But I, I assume that for most people, there are no other options. Right. That, they, that do do it on a consistent basis. And that's why they do it. And like they get used to it and they get pretty fast at it. Probably like when you're oh, doing yeah. it con- consistently, you can probably get it down pretty good. But again, they could easily just go back to using a uh, a computer if they had that option. That's what I think they would probably do. But everyone's their own. Maybe people will reach out to us and tell us how they use their phones. Yeah, that'd be yeah, that'd be a kind of a cool consensus. Is like, does anyone does anyone? Because we know we have a lot of beginners, for example, or even veterans uh, for that matter, in our Discord, for example. We know we have a bunch of veteran listeners and veteran veteran Discord folk and the beginners, like all like all the spectrum is basically what I'm trying to say in terms of experience, like where the beginners that are trying to absorb as much information as they can, are they using their phone constantly? Like are they constantly like are like on a remote desktoping in or are they what are they doing? Or are they specifically just have a specific study time? Are the veterans that have a bunch of websites already up that they need to support? Are they getting scared? Like, oh, I need to be able to always access, you know, my array of sites in case something goes wrong. So are they excited when an app, like an enterprise app, like, I don't know, again, I'm just making this up, but like a Cisco app or like a a, a new Apache app or something comes out and they're like, oh, I can now manage my website or oh, now I can manage like my router or my like routing device. Uh, are they like super excited when that happens? I don't know. It's just, I don't know. It, it is an interesting, it's just something I thought of the other day where I was thinking, I, I can't remember what ad it was, but it was just, it was one of those things where I saw it and I was just like, that's really cool that we can do that on the go, but like, I'm not going to do that. And I feel really sorry for the people that need to be that connected. If that makes sense, maybe I'm, maybe this is my old man coming out where I'm just like, we need work life balance, but I thought it was an interesting, uh, an interesting analysis, I guess, but for sure. Um, so I don't know if you have anything else to add, Mike, um, but it kind of sounds like we've exhausted this web news. Um, yeah. Yep. Already. Yeah. Let's do it up. Let's roll around. Roll the old conclusion. Well, uh, if you, uh, or if, if you've been listening, I hope you have been, if you're at this point, thank you for listening and, uh, make sure you don't <laughs> miss an episode by subscribing, uh, on the platform of your choice. You can follow us on the socials via at HTML, all the things on Facebook and Instagram. And we are at HTML, everything on Twitter. You can follow us on the medium and you can follow us on the GitHub and make sure that uh, you check out our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash HTML, all the things check out the tiers and give that a go. And with that said, many thanks to our $3 tier patrons, Sean from rabbit works, JavaScript. You can find him at youtube.com slash rabbit works, JavaScript and works is spelled W E R K S. He also Garrick from Local Path Computing and Web Design. You can find him at localpathcomputing.com. Craig, a.k.a. Cosworth. Ryan Gatchel from Blue Black Digital. You can find him at blueblackdigital.com. Chris from Self Made Web Designer. You can find him at selfmadewebdesigner.com. And Tim from The Web Hacker. You can find him at thewebhacker.com. 
and feel free to leave a comment or a review on the platform that you are listening to this on. And we are signing off. Yeah.